Some of you come here thinking, what have I come to? Why am I here? And uh, let me just say to you, there's no, it's not a coincidence that you're here. You're here for a reason. You've heard all these stories about God doing stuff in people's lives. But there's a hundred odd people here who could tell you other stories as well. Because this God we worship, this God we connect with, we can have an intimate relationship with him in which it's like me and you talking to each other now. And that's the reason why Jesus came, so that we can be free to do that. That's why we are alive on this earth, to be connected with God. And it was great news hearing about people being healed, people having situations turned around. But if they weren't healed, there's a bigger picture. Because we've been created to have an eternity with God as well. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that as we meet together now, connect with us, speak into our situations, challenge us. Help us understand more what it is to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Marcelo and Sophie, can you keep, can you keep, please sit, sit down. Can you stand up for a little while longer? While you're on holiday, be listening to God on your journey. Because while you're on your journey, he's going to connect you with people and you're going to be used by him on your journey. It's a mission and a holiday, okay? Sit down, please. Thank you. Jonathan Fitzwater, can you do the reading, please? Morning, everyone. <clears throat> Matthew 21, uh, verse 1 to 11. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them. And the he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David, son of David blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord praise God in the highest of heaven the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered who is this they asked and the crowds replied it is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee very well read thank you take your seat so as you know today is Today is, so I'm going to talk about, because today is Palm Sunday, so that's what I've been asked to do, so that's what I'm going to do. So um, a few things in this, from this passage, you've got this crowd of people gathered together, and you've got Jesus riding on a donkey, yeah? Now you think about it, okay? They've got their mindset, what they're thinking about. And Jesus got his mindset of what he's thinking about. Are the two things the same? We'll soon find out. And uh, 
what's your expectation in this room of who God is and what God and what knowing God is all about? Because I'm going off on a tangent here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because when we hear the words, God can save you, God can make a difference in your life, what does that mean to you? It's a question I want you to answer, so put your hands up, give me some information. What does it mean being saved by God for you? Jesus dying for you on that cross, what does it mean? Because he's the ruler for us all. Okay, anything else? God is working in daily life. God is working in your life. Anyone else? What does it mean to be saved by God? It means that even though I made a complete hash of my own life, that God's grace is amazing, and I know that I have hope of eternal life. Okay. Anyone else? He has bridged the gap between God and man. Forgiveness. Okay, quite a few, few there. One last one. Because you're leaving us for three months, I'll give you the mic for two seconds. It also means that when I die, I will go to heaven. Amen. We'll explore this later. Let's look at this story. So we've got two groups of people. We've got Jesus, the disciples, and you've got this big crowd, okay? We've got a few um, things like a donkey, palm branches, clothes laid on the ground, and a few words shouting out, Hosanna. And the understanding of what it is to be saved. Let's go back to Christmas, shall we? Because 33 odd years before this happened, Mary and Joseph were traveling to Bethlehem on a donkey, where Jesus will be eventually born in a stable and laid in a feeding trough. This is the God we worship. That was, that was the start of his life. So imagine, you're at the local farm, there's a feeding trough there, and a baby's in that trough where animals have licked their food out. That's where Jesus was laid. That's the start of our king's life. The king of love has come. So let's fast forward. 33 years later, he's traveling basically to his death. He finds a donkey, which his disciples find for him. And he rides on that donkey to Jerusalem. If you read Zechariah 9.9, which is written 500 years before this happened, it says this, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So that was Jesus fulfilling a prophecy from 500 years ago. Yeah? So, what does this symbolize? Well, a, a donkey was an animal which was used in everyday life. So the people around Jesus, the poor, the farmers, everyone around him will connect 
with that animal. So there's that. But also, Jesus riding a donkey was a symbol of a king coming to offer peace. Yeah? Now, the alternative could be Jesus riding on a horse. Which will be Jesus will be coming to uh, offer war. But in this situation, it's a donkey which fulfills a prophecy, but also it symbolizes Jesus' intention. He's come to serve and to give. The King of love has come. If you look at John 12, 17, there's a similar account. I'm not going to read it, but it says, The crowds have gathered up. They've all congregated in Jerusalem as they know Jesus is coming. And the reason why they've gathered up, because they've heard about the miracles Jesus had been doing, about Lazarus being risen from the dead. And uh, they want to meet this Jesus. They believe Jesus is the one who's going to save them. But what was their expectation? If you read John 12, 17, it says that even the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was here for. Luke 41, 42 says this, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from you, from your eyes. We'll come back to that in a minute. So Jesus is uh, approaching Jerusalem, and uh, they start laying their clothes down. They start laying branches down from palm trees. And, uh, you know, this is symbolic of victory. Did you know that? So the people, the crowd, in their mind, we're going to be victorious over something. We're going to be victorious over something. And this Jesus is the person who's going to show us this victory. During that time, the Romans were in charge of the area, of the whole, well, basically, the Roman Empire were the big, big um, people in charge of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, the Jews fell under oppression, and their belief was a Messiah is going to come who's going to defeat the Roman Empire and restore them back to their glory. We're going to be a great nation again. That's what their belief was. And they were shouting out these words. The message says, Hosanna. We sang that song early on, Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Hosanna in the highest. They're worshipping God. When you worship God, where does it take you? What does it do? If you think we're singing a few songs, and that's worshipping God, there's something more powerful going on than what you can see. Don't just look and see what's around you. Because there's something going on in what you can't see. And these guys were worshipping God. And what they're basically saying was, thanks God, 
You're so great. You sent your Messiah. You've saved us. And that's why they're worshipping God. But they were so, so wrong because of what they were thanking God for because they were thinking they were being saved from the Romans. When you're worshipping God, what are you worshipping God for? For the things God's done for you or for the fact that worship should be from our heart and who we are as a people of God? Jesus came to save those people. Not from the Roman Empire, but from themselves. Because the greater picture isn't the physical thing around us, which is bothering us. The greater picture is the life we can have with God. And often we mistake a relationship with God was with, he's Mr. Fix-It. If I pray for this, it's going to sort it out. If I pray for that, he's going to heal that person. If I pray for this, he's going to provide me that money. If I do this, ah, Mr. Fix-It, that's who God is. No, 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 no. He's not Mr. Fix-It. He's the living God who wants a relationship with you. And being saved by God, yes, it's all those things you said. But much, 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 much more. Being saved by God is like this. Who's, who's a parent here? Okay. Who's ever had a mum or a dad ever in your life? Put your hand up, yeah? <laughs> Do you remember those days when you were a bit younger? This was us yesterday for me. We just run up to your parents and you just stay in their presence, in their arms, and be held by them. Yeah? That's being held by daddy or mummy. And thus, uh, nothing matters. You're in daddy's arms. You're in mummy's arms. You've been on that late journey somewhere as a family, and uh, they're asleep in the back of the car, and um, you carry them, and they're oblivious what's going on, from the car to the bedroom, and the next morning they wake up, oh, I'm home. <laughs> this is what it's like to have a relationship with God. The sparskin in the presence of God, being with him for no reason at all but to be with him. And we get mistaken thinking, it's about the problems I go through in life he's going to save me from. You know what? You're going to have a hard time in heaven if that's what it was, because it's about being in his presence. The Jews at that time, the prophets who were called, had the privilege of being able to go into that temple, which uh, they could walk into and experience God's presence. Jesus died on that cross that everyone can explore and enjoy his presence anywhere, any place, any time. It's about an intimate relationship with God. And it's like me talking to you. You're hearing John talking about God telling me to speak to a certain person. God does that. He speaks to you. He talks to you about intimate things. He's real and he is someone who wants to know each of you in this room in that way. If you know God that way, great. But there's more to know. He just wants you to come in his arms for no reason at all but to know he's God. Jesus came to Jerusalem because in a few days' time he's going to be crucified on a cross that he would take upon himself the things we've done wrong. We separate us from God. There's a funny word called sin. That's what separates us from God. Jesus died that if anyone believes in him, anyone who allows him into their lives and baptised, 
will have a relationship with God and be connected. That's what he died for. But that relationship with God is a two-way thing where you can just experience his presence, experience what it is to know him and be set free because we in this world have been created for one purpose only, to live knowing God and to die knowing God. That's the only reason why we're here, to find out, to know who God is. That is our purpose. And in doing that, he will actually use us as part of his plan on this earth. These stories of Warren and John and other people meeting people, that's what we're about. Because Jesus is not a God, uh, a God of war. He is a God of love. And he wants you to experience that in every aspect of your life. And for you to pass that on to other people. We take communion here. And uh, next week we've got four baptisms. But what do you think happens when someone gets baptised? Do you think it's just a ritual where someone says a few things up here and uh, tell you about their story, why they become a Christian? And they go in a bit of water and go down in the water and they come up again and it's just a ritual? Or is there something powerful which happens to that person as they connect with God? The Bible says this, in this order, repent, believe, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent, believe, then be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this church, we do not baptize children or babies. Because we believe baptism is a choice of understanding of who Jesus is, why he died for you, and also uh, for you to turn around and put him first in your life. When you go in that water and come out of that water, you're being obedient to God. When we're obedient to God, something is transformed in us in that instant. Something changes in us. And it's not just we're getting baptised. Something transforms us spiritually. The people of Jerusalem were looking at the physical thing around them. Do not be blind by what you can't see. Because there is a wider world around us than what we can see. And that wider world includes a spiritual dynamic which we tap into when we know Jesus. Which we tap into if we don't even know Jesus in a wrong way as well. Because where there is a God, there is also a demonic force as well. Let's, we call him Satan. He's real. When we worship God, we are bringing down heaven onto earth. We're not just singing a few songs. We are engaging in power and authority. So you may have felt something during the worship. You may have felt, oh, what's that going on? It's the presence of God meeting with us. The Bible says, it's that prayer, isn't it? It's the, the Lord's Prayer. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven that's what our prayer should be and some of you may feel disconnected but let me tell you one thing you've come here not knowing that God wants to connect with you 
because that relationship with God is hard because it's against the flow of society but it's what life's all about so there'll be an opportunity for you to do exactly that to know God personally but to the wider people get connected in this spiritual battle bask in his presence like you did when you was a child and know what it is to know this awesome God he died for us that we can have eternal life so when we talk about sickness and that type of stuff if, if, he doesn't get, if you don't get healed you know Jesus you've got eternal life anyway the glory is the connection with God let's stand shall we We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.